not part of the economy. Supply chain is the economy. And I was, if you want to understand the economy, you're, you're really talking about the supply chain at every aspect. You know, something as simple as a, a loaf of bread. You know, you buy a loaf of bread at the grocery store. Like, okay, well, I guess it came from a baker, and I guess they took it from the bakery to the store by truck. So there's a supply chain. Well, that's about as simple a version of the supply chain as you can imagine. You have to just start going from there. It's like, well, did the bread come in a plastic wrapper or a paper wrapper? Well, that wrapper came from somebody. Where the truck come from? Well, obviously a truck manufacturer. Where the driver come from? Somebody had to make a career choice and, and be trained. And what about the diesel fuel in the truck? You know, that, well, that came from refinery and that came from oil exploration. Uh, then you get back to the baker and it's like, oh, well, I guess he had an oven or she had an oven. You know, where did that come from? And then you find out that the ovens are, you know, industrial ovens have parts from 25 different countries and, and so forth. Well, without belaboring that point, you get back to the farmer and the wheat and the fertilizer and and everything else and really what's called the extended supply chain and you're like wait a second that's a huge number of countries a huge number of inputs and a big part of the economy which it is and then every link in that supply chain i described has its own supply chain behind it to get to source materials and intermediate manufacturing and so forth and then that's for a loaf of bread well what about your car your furniture your clothes and, and and on and on and on once you start thinking about what supply chains are you realize it's just the cardiopulmonary system of the entire global economy so you know the supply chain book shines a light on the entire global economic process and i have whole chapters on that uh, talk about China, the war in Ukraine, and climate change. And you say, well, you know, the interesting topics, what do China, Russia, and climate change have to do with the supply chain? Well, the answer is they are, you know, kind of global macro earthquakes. Uh, Russia's invasion of Ukraine led to sanctions against Russia that affect everything, you know, imports, exports, strategic materials, semiconductors, uh, fertilizer, oil, natural gas, etc. Again, you're saying, well, okay, Boeing makes aircraft. They need titanium and aluminum. Where does that come from? Turns out about 30% of it comes from Russia. So how are you going to keep the Boeing assembly line going when you're shutting down strategic metals from Russia? You can go kind of on and on there. China, you know, everyone says, well, they slow down because of the, the zero COVID policy. And that certainly has been detrimental to their economy. Shanghai, a city of 26 million people, Beijing, a city of 22 million people, they were both locked down entirely last spring. When I say entirely, you know, no transportation in or out, uh, nobody on the streets. You had some essential workers, people had to get to work. You had to have a COVID uh, test, a negative result uh, that was not more than two days old. Uh, so these were extreme lockdowns and obviously very, very detrimental to the economy. Um, now, those have died down a little bit, and China's saying, well, now we're going to relax our zero COVID policy a little bit. So what's new? What, why are supply chains breaking down? Kind of what's new about the supply chain that makes it different than any other period in the history of the world? And what's new were, were two things, and they arose around 1989. The first was you had a combination of increased computing power, algorithms, artificial intelligence, better data collections and new models. So you suddenly had the, the computational telecommunications and data and mathematical tools to be a lot more sophisticated about how you handle the supply chain. Before we continue, help us clicking that YouTube like button and subscribe now to our channel. This shows the algorithm that you valued this information. And it helps us spread that message. Sharing is caring. And now, let's continue. But the second thing that happened at the same time was 1989, the fall of the Berlin Wall, 1991, the uh, collapse, the demise of the former Soviet Union, which gave rise to new trading partners in uh, both in Eastern Europe, where they were no longer behind the, the Iron Curtain, you know, Poland and Romania and uh, Hungary and, um, and many other countries. And at the same time, you had the rise of China. China did have a fairly high growth period in the 1980s, but um, nothing like we see today. And it all came crashing down in 1989 with the T Tiananmen Square massacre. And that really shut down U.S.-China relations, not fully, but there was, you know, there was no, there was no Western investment coming into China. The two countries were distant. Well, that ended around 1992. Deng Xiaoping did what he called the Southern Tour, where he reaffirmed China's commitment to capitalist principles. They weren't overthrowing communism, but they were 
embracing capitalist market ideas. There was a thaw in U.S. relations, and then it was like, you know, no holds barred. Then, then that's when the U.S. investment really did pour in. So, so all in a, a short period between uh, 1989 and 1992, uh, you had the fall of the Berlin Wall, the fall of the Soviet Union, new republics, China kind of re-enters the game. And all this, this was, this was globalization. So now all of a sudden you had the science I described, you know, computing and artificial intelligence and applied math and a true global market. So now, now the supply chains could go 9,000 miles from Chongqing to New York or from, uh, you know, Shanghai to Seattle or, you know, London to, uh, to, to Hong Kong, of course. So this was true globalization, much larger scale, much, much longer supply chains. And it worked. And so this was a period I call supply chain 1.0, 30-year period from 1989 to 2019. Now, why did it break down around 2019? Three things. A lot of people look at the pandemic and they go, oh yeah, COVID, that disrupted everything. That was the problem. And some people look at the war in Ukraine and the Russian sanctions and go, that was the problem. And they both made it worse. They both made it worse, no doubt about it, made the supply chain worse. But it really started in 2018 with Trump's tariffs on China. So he put, uh, Trump put tariffs on appliances and solar panels. Well, China didn't stand still for that. So China said, well, what can we do to strike back? Well, at the time, China was and is the world's largest importer of soybeans. They need the protein. They don't have enough. The U.S. and Brazil are the two largest exporters of soybeans. Well, China was buying all their soybeans from the United States because they were trying to reduce the trade deficit. We were buying so much stuff from them and China said, well, what can we buy from the U.S. just to kind of balance the books a little bit? And the answer was soybeans. Well, when Trump put the tariffs on, China redirected all of their soybean orders to Brazil. They stopped buying U.S. soybeans and they bought them all from Brazil. Well, there's a lot more to that than a phone call. You got vessels and dry bulk carriers and uh, transportation lanes and port facilities. And, you know, if you're Brazil and you get all these orders, you know, you got to get trucks to get the soybeans to the ports. You got to open up port facilities, etc. The point is, this is a major, major shift in global logistics just to change the order book from the U.S. to Brazil. Beyond that, people involved in this, they don't want six month contracts. They want five year contracts or at least three year contracts. And they got them. And so now all of a sudden, China's buying all their soybeans from Brazil. But this scramble of global supply chains. Now, what are the U.S. farmers doing? We're still growing the soybeans. We can't sell them to China. Well, it turns out the Netherlands needed them. So, okay, we'll sell them to the Netherlands and distribute them to Europe, which they did. And then this went on and on because Trump put more tariffs on to retaliate. China took more actions against the United States, canceled purchase. So, and it escalated from there. Now, again, COVID made it worse. The war in Ukraine made it worse. But it's very clear that that's where it started. So that's why I use 2019 as just, you know, kind of an arbitrary day, but the 30 year period of supply chain 1.0. Now we're getting to supply chain 2.0, but we're not there yet. We're in this like messy, in between, inefficient, muddling through period where things are broken, but they haven't, they'll never be put back together the way they were, but we haven't produced or created the new model supply chain. We're just muddling through and with a lot of disruption, a lot of empty shelves. You have to understand, it took us 30 years to build this. We blew it up in about three years.